Thank you very much. The plan for this was that I'd first discuss some background information about when uveal melanoma becomes metastatic, including screening. <clears throat> uh, to answer some of the questions that were going around just a few minutes ago, the first part takes about 15 to 20 minutes, then have a short just stretch legs break, and then discuss treatments for liver metastases. I'm not a consultant for anyone these days. <laughs> Radiologists are physicians who interpret images, MRIs, CAT scans, ultrasounds, chest radiographs, that sort of thing. Interventional radiology, I'm an interventional radiologist, is a subspecialty of radiology. Basically, we're doing surgical type procedures through tiny incisions, usually under x-ray guidance, occasionally under ultrasound or CT. Aside from treating liver tumors, um, some of my colleagues treat fibroids in the uterus, treat varicose veins. We put shunts through the liver to divert blood flow, drain blocked kidneys and blocked livers with tiny tubes through the skin, drain abscesses. It's a wide range of different procedures that we perform. But today we're talking about treating liver tumors. And we appreciate having Marlena and me here from Jefferson because we really are a national referral center for patients with metastatic uveal melanoma. About two thirds of our patients and quite a number in this audience live outside of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. To our knowledge, we're the only institution in the country with a weekly multidisciplinary conference dedicated to this disease with medical oncology, interventional radiology, body MRI specialists, and a radiation oncologist as needed. To the best of our knowledge, we're the only institution in the country with a weekly multidisciplinary clinic dedicated solely to this disease. We're performing more than 650 embolizations of the liver per year just for patients with this disease. And as you've gathered, about a third of the primary eye tumors in the country are treated at Will's Eye Hospital. As Karin Gonzalez likes to say, this is an orphan disease but it has found a home at Jefferson. And many of you know Takami Sato, Karn and I are the compassionate plumbers. Marlena, who actually made this slide, is sitting in the back, and you'll be hearing from her a little later. Robert Adamo is one of our interventional radiology colleagues, and Ronnie Ine assists us with uh, radiation oncology. But as you've heard again and again and again this morning, this is a team effort, and this requires a lot of people, be it nurses in the medical oncology office, the research staff and research nurses, and in interventional radiology, our technologists, our nurses, our PAs, and of course, right in the middle of this picture from one of the Miles for Melanoma runs is Renee Zielinski, who keeps us all organized and keeps everything moving for our whole program. And she sends her warm regards. About half of patients with eye melanoma will develop metastases at some point, which means that the other half won't. The liver is the predominant organ of involvement in more than 90% of patients with metastases. It tends to be the first and half of patients the only manifestation of the disease. There are some other places that these tumors can go such as lungs, liver, uh, lungs, bone, brain, nodules under the skin, little nodules inside the belly. But in general, not absolutely, but in general, the clinical course of patients with metastases is generally determined by progression of the disease in the liver. And the pattern of spread is very different from skin melanoma, which tends to go just locally to lymph nodes and subcutaneous tissues or to the lung and eventually other organs but this is a very different disease. Unfortunately, improved treatment of the primary tumor hasn't in itself resulted in prolonged survival. And realistically, tiny tumor cells have probably spread through the bloodstream prior to even diagnosis of the eye tumor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unlike skin melanoma, there's no effective systemic chemotherapy regimen for uveal melanoma. 
And unlike skin melanoma, the immune checkpoint blockade therapy, ipilimumab, pembrolizumab, for example, have an isolation of poor response and a lot of side effects. Uh, the prior speaker showed that very impressive PET scan of a skin melanoma patient who had gotten a, a drug targeting the BRAF mutation. Uveal melanoma doesn't have that mutation to target. There's no proven adjuvant therapy or preventive therapy to try to reduce the risk of metastases. There's an ongoing trial at Jefferson assessing the role of Sutent for that. Maybe in the future when it's approved, GP100 will be possible for that. But unfortunately, there's nothing there yet. So since the clinical course of most patients with this disease is based on what's happening in the liver, and since there's no good systemic therapy, that's why we focus on treatments directed right at the liver, where the tumors are. Surgery, ablation, or surgery or ablation, which is ablation is sticking a needle in through the skin to either freeze or burn a tumor, rarely useful for this disease since many, not all, but many, much of the time, there are multiple tumors, so it doesn't, it, it isn't practical. And there's a very high recurrence rate of tumors in the liver if patients undergo surgical resection within five years, four or five years of the initial eye tumor being diagnosed. Just this is an example of a patient who was going for planned resection of what was presumed to be a single tumor in the liver, but there are a bunch of little black dots on there. So discussion of this has already started today, but there are risk factors or there are, there are ways we can identify patients who are more apt to have to develop metastases. Um, chromosomal, chromosomal analysis, remember that we all have 23 chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes. So <clears throat> when part or all of the third chromosome is missing, that imparts a higher risk for developing metastases. And this was explained by, th there's actually a tumor suppressor gene on the third chromosome, but you need both of them to actually suppress the tumor. So if one of them's missing, that tumor suppression is lost. There are also significance with abnormalities of other chromosomes like eight and the first. This is a diagram which shows the top green line represents normal chromosomal in the tumor. And the, I should say the bottom line of the graft is by year development of metastases, or, or how long does it take until metastases develop? So the second line, the red line, is abnormality of the eight chromosome. The blue line below that is abnormality of the three chromosome. And then the black line where metastases tend to develop most quickly is high-risk patients where, by chromosomal analysis, abnormality of three and eight. The Castle system looks at 15 genes, which genes are tiny things on the chromosomes. And as many in, in the audience know, class one has a very low risk of metastasis. Class two has a high risk of metastasis. And there's overlap between the chromosomal analysis and the Castle class one, class two uh, gene, gene expression profiling. So now that we know who's at risk for developing metastases, the next question becomes, well, okay, how do we look for them? And in general, <clears throat> patients at high risk at Jefferson get an MRI of the abdomen every three months for at least two years, then every six months for a prolonged period. And the prior speaker was referring to the NCCN, National Cancer Comprehensive Network Guidelines, that came out a year ago. And looking at low-risk patients, so Castle Class A, normal genetics, small tumors, um, 
the recommendation is consider surveillance imaging. Certainly if there are any symptoms or signs, then imaging is relevant. Medium risk tumors, castle class B, tumors that are a little bigger. Consider surveillance imaging every six to 12 months for 10 years is the recommendation. High risk tumors, castle class two, monosomy three, gain of the 8Q arm, uh, larger tumors, ciliary body, extraocular extension. Consider surveillance imaging every three to six months for five years. So this pretty much becomes the same thing we've been doing for many years at Jefferson for high risk patients, then every six to 12 months for 10 years. This is a quote from the guidelines when they came out. So at a minimum, all patients should have contrast enhanced MR or ultrasound of the liver. Modality preference determined by expertise at the treating institution. There's a lot of variability in the way ultrasound is performed. It's a very operator dependent um, uh, procedure. Additional imaging modalities may include CT scan of the chest, abdomen, or pelvis with contrast. However, screening should limit radiation exposure whenever possible. Scans should be performed with IV contrast unless contraindicated. They go on to add, though, and this is a direct quote. I didn't write this. Recognizing that there are limited options for systemic recurrence and that regular imaging may cause patient anxiety, some patients may elect to forgo surveillance imaging. We'll get back to that in a moment. Okay. Just to address your question about CT versus MRI. These slides come from, the, this next set comes from Patrick O'Kane, who's one of my colleagues at Jefferson. He's one of the body imagers. Note the date on the bottom, August 2010. Nice normal looking CT scan and, does this work as a pointer? Uh, so, well, no, I forget. This is the liver, this is the stomach, this is the spleen, this is the front, this is the back. Imagine slices taken through and you're looking up from the feet. So this is actually the left side of the body, this is the right side of the body. Liver looks normal. Two months later, October, see a beautiful pancreas there in the middle. Liver looks normal. December, two months later, Liver still looks normal. So this is all the same patient, and this is that same patient back in April, four months before the CT scan. And you just look at the background of little white dots, particularly on the right-hand image. There were multiple tiny metastases in the liver that whole time, and the CT scans were normal. But kind of like the TV ad. But wait, there's more. So. <clears throat> This is a different patient. On the left-hand side of the slide are CT scans and using some different manipulation, but this is a good quality CT, and this is the MR. And be hard-pressed, maybe on some of the images, you might get a little sense that there's a little abnormality here. But by MRI, not only is there an obvious tumor here, but I'm too short to point out multiple white dots up there in the left lobe of the liver and some others throughout the liver. And just CT grossly underestimates that disease. Plus, remember, oftentimes liver-directed therapies are determined based on how much tumor is in the liver. So if you're grossly underestimating how much tumor is there, that's going to affect the therapy. Also may make one question clinical trials for this disease based on CT scans. A third example, and again, the CT scan, <clears throat> these two things are cysts, very common and very normal in the liver. With a little bit of imagination and manipulation to get on the real images, you can kind of get a sense that there might be a tumor there, but the MR shows multiple additional tumors uh, in the liver that were not recognized by CT. So we've talked about who's at high risk for developing metastases. We talked about 
how often to screen and how to screen. Now what do we do? Okay. Are there any treatments? And it's kind of amazing that in 2019, we're still fighting the battle of is treatment for this disease once it metastasizes helpful? Okay, so one, I'm not involved in the Immunocore GP100. You'll be hearing about that later. Please pay attention. But even though that's still in clinical trial, we believe there's adequate evidence to support liver-directed treatments. And let's look at two examples. So looking at our friends from Mayo Clinic, they looked at 100 patients over admittedly a long period of time. And what they were trying to compare was patients who got some of these newer immunotherapy agents, uh, ipilimumab, um, and some other target agents, Avastin kinase inhibitors, did they live longer than patients who historically at Mayo had been treated with liver-directed therapy? And the answer was no, they didn't. That, so this has nothing to do with screening, but while it was not a head-to-head -head trial or anything like that, and they acknowledged that the patients going under liver-directed therapy were in a little better shape, but it's evidence that that confers a benefit. Takami Sato and his daughter, who conveniently is a budding medical oncologist, have looked at a long-term experience at Jefferson. And they took one group of patients from 1971 to 1993. Okay, admittedly ancient history, but who were largely treated with systemic chemotherapy. And they compared that group to patients in this century, most of whom started their treatment for liver metastases using liver-directed therapy. Now, between the two groups, the primary eye tumors, in other words, where this started, they were similar in size of the tumor, thickness of the tumor, location of the tumor. So you're starting off with two groups that are shockingly pretty similar. I didn't bother putting on the slide that patients who underwent liver-directed therapy lived longer because one could easily argue, well, in this century, they probably were screened, so they found smaller tumors, and that's the reason why. However, what they found is between the older group and the more modern group that had liver-directed therapy, the patients were living longer after having received liver-directed therapy from the time of their eye tumor diagnosis. And again, we went back and said, well, the two groups were pretty similar with their eye tumors. So this is why we continue to offer liver-directed treatment for this disease. And just to leave with two slides, this is a patient who was getting regular MR screening. Uh, his MRI six months before was normal, and he unfortunately six months later showed up with a number of big tumors in his liver. This is a patient who, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, or if it's here, I can't find it. In December, had a very small tumor. We weren't, she wasn't followed at Jefferson yet. She was told, get another MR in three months. Well, three months became four and a half months, and you see a big tumor there in her liver. We saw her two or three weeks later. Her daughter was about to get married, and I didn't want her to potentially do anything to mess that up. So the plan was get an MRI, go to the wedding, come the following Monday for treatment. And you can just see how dramatically the tumor has grown in under six months.